is to behave as a patriarch or a matriarch, to forgive them for their errors, to give them a way out, to allow them to save face, but to stop behaving as trustees, to stop behaving as willing slaves. That's a fine line. I'm still coming to terms with it. It's all new. So we will be updating that material and I look forward to talking with you on the role of the General Executive of the Estate of a Legal Person in coming weeks. And I look forward to being able to share with you practical examples of how this material might be used. Now, with the time remaining, I want to talk to you about some of the insights that I wasn't able to talk with Michael Vara with on the radio the other night. And the question he asked me before the whole interview went dead was, with the founding fathers of the US Constitution and the present system, was there... Uh, any intention with the Founding Fathers that the system we see today get put into place? And if there wasn't, is there any kind of remedy that we can use to hold these people to account? The point I made is when you read constitutions, whether it be the United States Constitution or the Constitution of Australia, no point in those documents was there any intention that our rights could be alienated as they alienated our rights, especially since 1933? There is no evidence in those documents that they ever uh, permitted the societies uh, to be converted into corporations for the benefit of a few. In fact, in the Australian Constitution, there is even a penalty if such matters are taken into account. And I'm sorry I can't quote the exact error in it, but I hope on the University of UK that we can get a, a section up there where I can get this material up there for you. But in the Australian Constitution, there's actually a provision there where public servants are directly liable, elected officials are directly liable for sitting in office uh, where there is, they are usurping the original intention of the Constitution. In the United States Constitution, it is made absolutely clear that our rights are inalienable. That means they cannot be alienated. And yet, when we talk about what happened with uh, international law in Article 260, and when we speak in terms of Article 329 of Prisoner of State, that is exactly what the executive has done. The executive in America has alienated your rights in open defiance of the Constitution, and no one is holding them account. No one. So there is remedy in the system. Now, I'm not suggesting any of you uh, go and uh, start a case where you try and uh, hold them to account on your own. That really is a matter of bringing the communities to life. And to let you know, what I've been working on is tying up the charters of the unions and the charters of the various universities and the charters of the campuses, as I've promised, to get them ready so that you can download them, you can read them, you can review them, and those of you who are ready can start to incorporate the campuses. Now, the campuses and the provinces are certainly the structure best suited to go and pursue these things. If you want to know, the Covenant of One Heaven has been updated and is now in a downloadable document, which you can go and get from the University of Acadia. There was another part to this that I was asked earlier this week when we're talking about how this system, this private bar system, how this international legal system can sustain itself. Uh, how, what is the weakest points of their system? How do we overcome a system that 
that seems to, to have privatised everything, that has stripped our rights, that now uses uh, trickery and force against us. The point I made, which was one that we often don't really, I think, realise when we talk about presumptions in their system, is this. Their system, since the 19th century, their largest presumption since the 19th century is the presumption that God is dead. The whole system is predicated on the belief that God is dead. Nietzsche said it. The philosophy, psychology is based on God is dead. Legal realism is based on the premise that God is dead. We need to hold them to account to this heresy. On the one hand, they claim to be the agents of the last will and testament of God. They changed. They changed the scripture from the old covenant and new covenant to the old testament and new testament. Well, what does the new testament mean in the Bible? It means that they are claiming it is the last will and testament of God. They are openly claiming that God is dead. In writing, they are claiming that God is dead. We need to hold them to account because every office that they hold is an office based on the presumption that God must be alive, that there must be a divine creator. Otherwise, there is no such thing as an office. Their authority, and we've gone through this with authority. If you want to look and, and see what we mean by authority, go and have a look at the uh, canons uh, under 7.4, Article 262. Look at authority under 262, 63, 64. Look at all that. Authority is based on the premise of the existence of, of a divine creator. Yet their whole system is based on the presumption that God is dead. It means they have no authority, none. The system is operating on vapours. The system was dead years ago. But men and women haven't challenged it. They haven't challenged it at its root. Their system is based, their ultimate presumption is based on God is dead. And because of that, their whole system is without a foundation stone. Their law has been rendered null and void. Their covenants are null and void. They are without any authority. You can't have authority if you don't believe there is a divine creator. You can't have an office if you don't believe there is no divine creator. It is time to challenge that presumption. It is time to hold them to account. Now, in the time available, I'll let you know what we've been doing on the Bank for International Settlement and the proposed package that we spoke about a few weeks ago. As I've been updating these covenants and I've been looking at the union charters and the university charters, part of this is, is in line with getting the monetary system rolled out. And you've heard me say it week after week, and I know it, it, it's frustrating that it's not there yet, but it's got to be right before it just simply gets thrown out. It has to be right before we issue documents. One of the concerns in writing to the Bank for International Settlement was the original presumption that when we write to them, we are offering something to them. Now, why that didn't sit well is because a number of you said, if the material that you have shown under the settlement birth certificate, and I'm referring to Article 325, settlement birth certificate, if, if the research on the, on the birth certificate being actually a settlement certificate, being a certificate of being a voluntary slave of a plantation is true, then the Bank for International Settlements is ultimately the head office of global slavery. We don't want to honour such a perverse, horrendous and unsustainable system 
by making any offer to them at all. So what is it that the package for August the 15th really should be focused on? And the answer lies in the writings that were sent out, the writs that were sent out last December, December the 21st, 2010. In June, we wrote to Benedict and we wrote to the head of the Jesuits and we wrote to the Franciscans as witness to the fact that the Master Trust, the Trust of Trusts, the trust that's called Pontifex Romanus, the Roman Pontifex, the Roman Pontiff, which claims all real property, has been dissolved. Now, there was a second trust that they created. That second trust they created was called the Attorney Regis in about 1481, I think. I can't remember, but it's there on the documents. Attorney Regis, the Eternal Crown, was the second perpetual trust created by the Vatican and by Venice and the Khazars, the, the Magyar. A parasite. So when we write, and I will have this package up on University of Acadia, and I've said this before, I know you've been waiting, but the package of material will be up on University of Acadia within the next 24 hours. When we write to the Bank for International Settlement, and we write back to the Vatican, and we write back to the Jesuits, and we write back to the Franciscans, it will be the following, 42 days have now elapsed since our first package and we are going to salvage the property now from the dissolved trust of Pontifex Romanus and furthermore, the trust attorney Regis has been dissolved and because the trust attorney Regis has been dissolved, the Bank for International Settlement has no legitimacy whatsoever. To continue, the settlements themselves have been dissolved. The settlement certificates, the basis of them, have been dissolved. Now, I hope you are in agreement that this is the right approach and we will mirror the previous of sending a private writ to each member and the public writ as well, a writ of probate, considering the dissolving of a trust. That package will be up to be reviewed and for those of you that are wishing and willing to assist, uh, you can download the material from U of U. Uh, we'll have a list of those that are helping in the north, the south, the west and the east, and we'll get that package out. So I'm sorry it's been a delay to get it ready, but I do believe that is the right historical context. The, the dissolving of Attorney Regis, the Crown, the Crown Corporation, the Crown Company, the plantation managers of the slaves, the settlement certificates, the Bank for International Settlements, we're not going to honour their system. We're going to dissolve their system. And that's what this writing needs to be. Well, I thought we needed an extra 10 minutes. Uh, I think I've covered a fair bit tonight. I hope it wasn't too disjointed. I hope in uh, the points we covered uh, that you found useful, the updated information. I look forward to answering your questions. And thanks again for all those that are coming on and thanks for those that share the information. We keep pressing ahead. So thanks very much and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Very good, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, we talked earlier about covering um, inalienable and unalienable and um, the difference or possibly similarity um, between the two. And what is the correct term? The correct term is inalienable, as it has been written in the Constitution and the Declaration. Inalienable is the correct term, not unalienable. Very good, thank you. All right. Uh, First question that was over on the chat, uh, and just as a quick reminder, those of you on the phone, as we go in to our question and answer session, if you'll press star eight on your phone, 
that will put you in the question queue and we can get to your questions 